Welcome to Life Imitating Movies, a weekly podcast where we talk about the real life events that have been going on from the last week or so, stories from across the web, and the movies that we think resemble these real life events going on. So I'm your host, Mitch, and with us is our other host, Brad. Hello. So let's start things off this week. You know, I've been, I'm kind of playing host this week with this week's episode. So, you know, the question I pose to you, and I'm going to go first with my answer, but the question this week is what movie scene to this day still makes you cry, still makes you well up and and brings out some emotion in you. And for me, as soon as I picked the question, I had the answer. And the truth is, like, there's a handful of them. You know, it's not just one movie scene that everybody has that makes them cry. There's there's a few out there for most people, but there's always a clear cut choice. And for me, that one is when Mufasa dies in The Lion King. And I feel like this is the answer for a lot of people. It's it's just a uh, such a classic scene, and really just it brings out the emotion for so many people with it. And you know, for me especially, um, you know, it just like the the music, you know, that sets the stage for it by Hans Zimmer while the scene is going on. Uh, you know, the voice acting from Jonathan Taylor Thomas, who voiced Simba and, you know, the sequence of events that go on where, you know, uh, Simba is calling out for help and he's he's trying to wake his dad up and then he just decides to finish it, you know, by um, curling up under him, you know, one last time and just enjoying that time with his dad. And it's just, it, it never, it never fails to evoke some emotion for me. That one is just always, always gets me. Yeah, so I have to ask, is that one of your all time favorite movies? Cause I'm pretty sure you, you, you talked about Lion King last week as well. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I think I picked it as, as one of my movies, with the articles, but it is, I will say, and I think I've told you before, but not on the show that, the Lion King is probably my favorite animated movie ever. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I say probably because, you know, if I really sit down and rack my brain, maybe I can come up with another one. But I'm pretty sure The Lion King is my my favorite anim- animated movie of all time. Damn, yeah, man. It's a, it's a good, it's a great animated. I think of the traditional 2D. Oh, no, I, I got to go Aladdin over Lion King. Aladdin's my all time. Robin Williams is one of my idols, so I Aladdin. But no, I know exactly what you're talking about because I remember not being super familiar with Shakespeare when I was younger. I didn't realize that that was essentially it's Hamlet. And yeah. so as you grow older, you realize, oh, that's Hamlet, and Hamlet's a heavy play, man. And I I I applaud Disney for really delving into something so heavy in, in a children's flick. Because I mean, yeah, and and isn't that the thing with Disney? Don't they talk a lot about um, Disney deals a lot with dead dads? Like they do a lot of. of yeah, that's like, that's kind of that's almost like kind of a complaint that I have with Disney, where to get emotion out of its viewers and to make viewers cry, a lot of those moments that that bring up those emotions for people are parents dying or somebody dying, man. and and there's ways you could get people to feel emotional and to to shed a few tears in your, your heartfelt movie without killing off a a relative, which is, you know, extra funny to me because Disney's supposed to be about family and it's supposed to be family friendly. And it's just, it's, it's funny that they always, that's their go-to is to kill off somebody to, to get some, some tears. Well, it worked. Yeah, I I guess (laughs) so. But, but you know, you know what kind of went against that, which we just talked about last week was soul you know, it, it deals with that kind of concept a little bit of, of death and the afterlife and before life. But, you know, the, the big emotional moments in that movie that maybe kind of get you with, you know, crying a little bit, they, it's not someone dying. It's, it's, it's kind of the opposite where it deals with the, the beauties of everyday life. So, you know, it's, it, it was, that was a nice change of pace to evoke some emotion to, to see that. Thanks. I think, I think Lion King might have been the first Disney movie that people saw as a children's movie with adult themes. I'm trying to think before that Aladdin was phenomenal. One of obviously my favorite of the 2d animated, not really adult themes, maybe a little, it had evil, but they all have evil Pinocchio, little mermaid, but that one was really 
with the death of the father was like the first that I can think of right now off the top of my head that really delved into super adult themes, which again, based off of Hamlet, which is one of the most kind of messed up plays I've ever written, really. Yeah. So, you know, enough about uh, dying relatives, you know, I'm sure you pick something wildly different that could get a, a different, you know, kind of scene that, you know, brings up some emotion. Uh, I do. And, and for this week's episode, I brought visual aids. So <laughs> my guy cry movie, it's a movie. I, I, I'd bet a million dollars you've never seen. Uh, I, I'm not even sure if you've heard of it. Uh, it came out in the eighties. It's a, it's a, it's a fighting movie, a karate movie, and it's called Best of the Best. No? No, I can't say I've never I've never heard of it. Oh, man. So Best of the Best is a story about um, karate tournament, and uh, it's got Eric Roberts. You know Eric Roberts? Yeah. Okay, so it's got Eric Roberts. He's like the main guy. Chris Penn, phenomenal Chris Penn, departed. Uh, Sean Penn's brother, he passed away, and Philip Ree, but it's a it's a it's a movie. It's got James Earl Jones in it as well, and it's just a movie about it's about a karate tournament in America versus um you know uh, Korea, and uh, so I'm gonna give away the ending because I'll try and walk around it a little bit, but the ending is a sentence. basically Philip Ree in the movie plays a guy who whose brother was in the tournament when he was younger, and a Korean counterpart actually killed him in the ring. So Philip Ree has this desire for revenge against the guy. And so you get to the end and there's the big America versus Korea fight. And Philip Ree's in the ring and, uh, and he can he can kill the guy in the ring. And he chooses, he chooses the mercy or whatever, and which makes the other guy win. And in the final part of the movie, the, the music wells up. And for me, score is everything. The, the score... I am a film score aficionado. I love film score. So when that music starts and you're just like, you're already like, oh man. And the, the Korean guy just beat up in his, in a sling walks over to Philip Ree and he gives him his medal and he gives a long speech about how awesome his brother was and how it was, you know, and, and it wasn't, it wasn't like he, he apologized for what happened in the ring and his big emotional speech. And then, they're standing there and they're crying. And then all the other Korean team, because the Korean team won the, the tournament because of the mercy that he showed and all that stuff. And so they all come over and they give the Americans their, their medals and everything. And that movie for me, that scene for, for me is the ultimate crying movie moment for me. That is the one that like, I can't, I can't be around anybody for like at least 30 minutes after. Cause these eyes are just, and it's, it's it's a great movie, man. It's it's I mean it's it's an eighties in the vein of a karate kid, but a little bit more adult. So I I'd recommend it. What was the name of it again? Best of the best. Best of the best. I might have to check it out okay. uh sometime soon. So you know, we're, so we're, we're trying to start off on, you know, a good note discussion wise, you know, maybe these topics are a little bit heavier. They bring out some emotions in people, but you know, I guess that could be a good thing too. So I will say for the rest of the episode, I'm excited to, to talk about what else we got because, you know, not only with the Lion King well, at the beginning, say. but I, you know, some of the movies that I picked out for this week are some of the most excited, you know, I've been so far to talk about on the show and, you know, it's going to be a little bit of emotion too with some of the the stories and the emotions. So I can't wait to get to the rest of the episode here. So our first story starting off here, um, you know, we were filming last week's episode last Friday um, when news kind of broke of Hank Aaron passing away. And shortly after that, during this week, this uh, previous week here, you know, we got the news of the passing of Larry King as well. And, you know, Obviously, people are kind of passing away these days. You know, it, it always happens. You know, people that you know and love, you know, big names. But these were two that kind of really stood out to us. And, you know, we really want to kind of pay them tribute because they just changed their respective landscapes and their fields so much and just contributed so much to, you know, society. So, so starting off with Hank Aaron, um, you know, he 
played in a country and a world that was still kind of in turmoil over civil rights. And, you know, I can't imagine what it must have been like for him kind of playing and going through society with these, you know, changes still going on and to be a black man to break Babe Ruth's record, a hallowed legend in the game of baseball, a white player, and for people to so well receive him, just not enough can be said about that moment. And to me personally, the guy is still the home run king. I don't care what the record books say about Barry Ponds. That guy is a cheater. You know, sure, he was a great player before he started taking steroids. But the point is, we knew he took steroids. You can't, we don't know how well he would have done without steroids. So you can't say that, you know, he belongs in the Hall of Fame or that he's the true home run king for me. It's still Hank Aaron. And, you know, just really sad to hear about him pass away. Yeah, man. So with Hank Aaron, I, I'll be blatantly honest. I thought Hank Aaron had died a long time ago because Hank Aaron is such a monumental, legendary name. I didn't realize that he was still around. And I guess I never, he wasn't ever in the public eye of recent. So I never really knew that he was still around. Because when you think of legends, you, you think of past tense. And that's when I heard Hank Aaron had died. I was like, wow, I didn't, I, I honestly didn't realize he was still around. And because that, you know, Babe Ruth is gone, Jackie Robinson is gone, legends. When you think of a legend, you don't think of somebody you can still go go and see, go and talk to or whatever. So uh, when, when I saw that he had passed away, that one was a, uh, was it was it was a shocker. And just to give you an idea about how soon and sudden this was one of the last things that Hank Aaron did, one of these kind of public eye things that he did was get a vac COVID-19 vaccine on camera with some other prominent black figures, both in sports and out of to yeah. kind of demonstrate to people that, this is what we should be doing and it's safe and, you know, not to worry in anything. So, you know, it really just gives you an idea of how, how quick this was and how modern, how this just happens. And, you know, moving on to, to Larry King here, you know, again, not, uh, you can't say anything like too much about this guy either. He, he's been a figurehead in entertainment and he's been one of the go-to interviewers for, uh, probably longer than I've been alive. And, you know, everyone under the sun has appeared on his show and he's, you know, met almost everyone you can think of that is a household name. And it just, you know, again, uh, you know, the guy, because he's been around for so long, seems like he's had a, a really long, enjoyable life. And I really hope that's that's the case. I agree. And I have a visual representation again. I do own... The greatest interviews by Larry King of Larry King Live. I hope you can see that. Good DVD. Phenomenal. Got all the Bill Clinton, George Clooney on it. I mean, yeah, Larry King was just a legend. And Larry King was a guy who always had a sense of humor, man. Everybody was making fun of his age and everything for like the last 10 years, 20 years of his life. That was like the go-to joke for like age-related humor. And, and to relate it back to baseball... I kind of, I feel, I feel bad and good. Diehard Dodger fan, Larry King was. He got to see his Dodgers take the championship this last year. Because of COVID, he didn't get to see it in person. So it's a bittersweet thing where it's like he, his team won. Because if you ever watch those live baseball games, Larry King was right behind home plate. And uh, so it's a bittersweet thing. He got to see the Dodgers win. He didn't get to see it in person. So a so, little bit of a consolation prize, but, you know, it's I'm still glad he got to see that for sure. And, you know, yeah, that's man. a good kind of segue into my movie that I picked for this where, you know, I talked about Hank Aaron. I still picture him as the true home run king. And, um, you know, back in the 90s, there was a lot of excitement in baseball where the single season home run record was being broken and reset a couple of times and the movie that I picked has to do with that. So the movie is a little one called 61 with an asterisk and not a lot of people might know about this. It's a good sports movie. It was actually directed by Billy Crystal, who's a big baseball fan and it deals with the 1961 Yankees. Two players, Roger Maris and Mickey Mantle are 
chasing Babe Ruth's single season home run record where Babe Ruth hit 60 and they try to break it in this season and the turmoil that kind of follows because the Yankee fans really took to mantle but didn't really have the same affection for Roger Maris because he wasn't really a Yankee in their eyes. So it's a good, it's a good drama movie. It's a good sports movie. And, you know, there are some recognizable faces in it too. Thomas Jane, who uh, some people might know as the Punisher, among other things, he plays Mickey Mantle and I think does a really good job of kind of capturing his personality. And obviously this takes place in the sixties. It has a really well-made aesthetic and kind of looks and feels like that era and they used a, a combination of practical and special effects to shoot in Tiger Stadium is where they filmed and called it Yankee Stadium in the movie, the old stadium. So, um, you know, it's it's a good sports movie. It's a good drama movie. I definitely would recommend it to people who are fans of either one of those. I have not seen 61. It's, uh, it's one of those that's on my uh, Amazon purchase list to buy because – I love Billy Crystal and I love baseball movies, but just haven't seen it yet. But yeah, I can't really add much to it. I think with that recommendation, I might pick it up this week and give it a watch, especially we're in between seasons right now. So yeah, yeah, you, you need, you need a baseball fix. Yeah. So, um, I guess, yeah, I don't, I'm sorry. I don't have much to add to 61 cause I haven't seen it. and Don't know much about it other than what you already said. So, I'll go with my movie now, if that's cool, which is I just went through the list and I found the first movie that Larry King was in where he did his Larry King thing, which in movies, in the 90s movies, that was the thing. And Anytime there was like a news segment, you had, you know, Los Angeles, you're on live. That was Larry King's thing. And so the first movie that he ever did that in is a little movie you may have heard of called Ghostbusters. <laughs> And that was the first one he did it in. And that was, he did, you know, he did his thing when the ghosts were coming into the, to the city or whatever. And I mean, you can talk about Ghostbusters, but really just talk about these guys, man, because uh, we're losing legends, man. It's, it's where we, we're hitting that age now where the people we actually look up to are, are, are passing away. And that's, that's a, the thing that lets you know, it makes me think of my own mortality almost. Cause I remember, you know, when you're younger, people like, you know, Frank Sinatra pass away or people like that. And you're like, oh, those are the, those are like, oh, those are my parents' age people. But now we're losing people that I actually was like a huge, big fans of. And it's, 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 death sucks. Yeah. It, it, it certainly hits hard, especially like you said, when we get older and we see these people dying who have been around for a lot of our lives. And, I think especially it hits harder because obviously with everything going on right now, any little piece of bad news just has a little extra added impact, unfortunately. But, um, you know, we can still remember these people for the, the great, you know, parts of their lives that they did have. And we can always remember them how they were instead of how they, you know, kind of left the world. So, but Ghostbusters, I mean, you know, to kind of change topics a little bit here, but Ghostbusters is... I mean, what else could you say about it? It's it's a classic. It's got, you know, great performances. Bill Murray is all time performance in that. And, you know, the the ghosts, it's just like it's such a great movie. You know, just talking about it makes me want to go back and rewatch it. And I don't know if you know this, but it's it's one of the favorites of uh, Q, who is on a little show called Impractical Jokers that we both like. So that's one of his favorites. And I can certainly see why, you know, anyone who grew up in the 80s, you know, probably loves that movie. Yeah, man. I just realized that I picked Ghostbusters for a movie where we're talking about people that died. It was a bit of a bit of a coincidence. Um, yeah, I mean, what can you say about Ghostbusters? It's just it's one of the greatest things ever made. The end, period. All right, so moving along, my next story is something that apparently just got reported this week but apparently happened in 2019 I, I just saw the story this week because it was on colbert made a joke about it and it's a story about how a grocery store in canada uh had uh got a shipment of of 76 million pounds worth of bananas with cocaine in them and uh 
you know, it's one of those stories. It's just interesting. You know, there was a, there was a slip up somewhere. Some doc somewhere got something mixed up and some uh, banana lovers got a, uh, got a little bit more potassium than maybe they, they're used to. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. yeah I, think, I think the, uh, the real bananas may have gone to the drug dealers. You know, I think they may have gotten the real product and then the fake bananas full of the drugs went to the grocery store. So I think, I think maybe the dealers now have their extra potassium for a while. Uh, yeah. I, I like to think that's what I like to think about that. I think, yeah, they, I, I mean, it's a funny story to think of, but I guess if you were to watch a movie about this, somebody probably died because of this. Somebody, somebody got, somebody got offed. So, but so when I was the story, the only thing I could think of was Bad Boys Two. I know it's backwards, but you can read backwards. Bad Boys Two, because if you remember Bad Boys Two. The drugs that they're shipping are in inside the cavities of dead bodies. So that's what it made me think of: drugs inside of bananas and drugs inside of dead bodies. Which we can just now talk about bad boys and bad boys. Too. Have you seen those? First of all, no, yeah, I, I haven't seen smile. the first two. But um, you know, did you see the third one? Because the third the third one is actually really interesting in the scope of the world because. Bad Boys for Life is the number one movie in the U.S. for 2020. It, it, it came out in, I believe it was either January or February. January. And that was obviously before everything kind of shut down. And we basically got almost no more new movies for the rest of the year. So Bad Boys, the third one, Bad Boys for Life is the number one U.S. movie of 2020. Yeah, which I think Will Smith said he wanted it to be the high, before it came out, before the world knew of coronavirus, simpler times. Um, I think he had said he was like, I think this movie is going to be the highest grossing movie of the year. And I'm sure he was. He knew, like you know, you had a, uh, you had a, you had some big movies coming out that year, and so, but it ended up being that movie. But man. You gotta go back and watch the bad boys. Did you see the third one then, and not the first two, or no? You haven't seen them. No. Okay. So. I, you know, in, in hindsight, I wish I kind of would have because if I had known that would be one of the last few new movies for the year, because I heard it was pretty good. You know, if I had known back then what I know now, I probably would have gone to see it in theaters as one of the last theater experiences of the year, and who knows how long into twenty twenty one. Yeah. Um. I, well, I guess we can go into the bigger discussion, which is, are you a Michael Bay fan or have you not seen a lot of Michael Bay movies? I mean, The Rock, Bad Boys, Armageddon, are you not not a fan? I'll be honest, I'm not a huge Michael Bay fan. Um, you know, I do think he has his better movies and his really not good movies. So, you know, there are different degrees, but on the whole, I'm not a huge Michael Bay fan. Okay, I, I am a, I love Michael Bay. I, the Island, Armageddon, that The Rock, those are all movies like, in terms of my action movies, those are like top 10 action movies for me. I love them. I, I, I went to film school. So in film school, I heard a lot of, oh, Michael Bay sucks. You should watch Wes Anderson movies. And I'm like, I do watch Wes Anderson. I love Wes Anderson. I also like Michael Bay. <laughs> so it was a lot, a lot of film nerds, I think, thumb their nose at, at Michael Bay. And you know, the guy makes brain dead action movies. And sometimes I want to go to the theater and watch a brain dead action movie. I love the Transformer movies. What can I say? They're the music. And that goes back to the thing I was talking about earlier about film scores. The Transformer movies are some of the best scores. I love the music in those movies. But um, I, I would recommend checking out Bad Boys and Bad Boys 2. Bad Boys 2 gets a little bit more craft than bad boys one bad boys one i think is one that like when people are like do you like michael bay the like, no michael bay sucks oh but bad boys are pretty good so you should go back and check them out man do do, do a marathon i i might at some point i just think you know with guys like michael bay these days i just think we need to hold studios and directors accountable for a better quality of of movie even if it's an action movie you know look at some good action movies out there some smart ones and it's like hey we can have this kind of action movie if we just you know hold people accountable for you know working a little bit harder or coming up with some more original better ideas i mean one of my favorite action movies of all time is terminator 2 judgment day 
And I mean, just look at that one. Like, you know, they, they went all out for that one. And it, it turned out, it, I think it's, I will argue with you that it is the greatest action movie ever. So I just think, you know, the more we kind of hold people accountable to say, hey, like, you know, most of us aren't complete idiots. Just give us a little bit of like a, you know, a slightly, just slightly more complicated action movie with like good plot, good characters, you know, still good action, obviously. And it's like, we'll, we'll show up. We'll, we'll like it. So obviously there are a lot of movies out there about drug trafficking, but I use this opportunity to talk about another one of my favorites, which is the movie Sicario. And Sicario is a, it, it's just so great. I could watch that one over and over again, even though it's not a, one of those de- ones you would deem rewatchable, like in Avengers or like, you know, something you just kind of put on in the background and watch, you know, over and over again in the background. But Sicario is a very well directed, acted, you know, t- t- take your pick. Everything is just really great in it. It's directed by Denis, D- Dennis, Denis v- v- Villanueva, v- Villanueva, however you say his name, you know, the same guy that has the Dune reboot coming out that looks great. And he's done a handful of other just really great movies as well. And you know, one of the many reasons I love this movie as well is because it's led by a female for a change who plays like a, you know, tough uh, police officer or law enforcement person. And that's Emily Blunt. And, you know, she does a great job. Uh, Daniel Kaluuya kind of plays her, you know, uh, best friend, partner, you know, in the movie. And, you know, if you don't know the name, he's mm-hmm. from Black Panther, Get Out. You know, he's, you know, kind of starring in those big mm-hmm. projects. But Sicario is just such a a smart, just great movie about the drug trade and, you know, its effect on people and countries and U.S. versus Mexico. And it just it it, it just works on on so many different levels. I love that movie so much. Yeah, dude, Sicario is one of the best. And again, phenomenal film score. Um, And that was written by Taylor Sheridan, who I don't know if you know Taylor Sheridan. He's. He's got the show Yellowstone on TV right now. He was, if you ever watched Sons of Anarchy, he was uh, the police officer on that show in, in Sons of Anarchy. He's, just, he's a phenomenal writer. And he writes like really good, gritty, gritty movies. He did Hell or High Water. I mean, he guy's a phenomenal writer. Um, and dude, Sicario's good, man. I mean, that movie kind of, like you said, I forgot Daniel Kaluuya was in it. I forgot, I forgot he was in it. Cause, but yeah, the beginning is, don't they find like a bunch of dead bodies in the wall in that, in that house? And that's like how the movie kind of kicks off. You're like, okay, we're in for a ride on this one. Yeah, it, it, it kicks off on such like a high octane note. And, you know, those two people that we that you and me named, like that's just the, the tip of the iceberg for the cast. It's got uh, John Bernthal, Victor Garber, Josh Brolin. Um, oh, my God. Benicio Del Toro. It's just like it has so many great names and everyone does such a great job acting in this movie as well as other familiar faces along the way. But it just it's got a a great cast. So how did you feel about the sequel, Day of the Soldado? I didn't say it. So our next story here, um, obviously, the Super Bowl is a big event com- coming up in a couple of weeks. And for the first time since 1983, Budweiser won't be advertising their their Hallmark beer, Budweiser, not Bud Light or some of their other offshoot products, because they will still be advertising for some of those, which are, uh, you know, the Bud Light Seltzer, the Michelob Ultra. But, um, you know, they didn't want to spend money this year because they thought apparently that it would be tough to find the right tone for advertisements. You know, you can't go too goofy with everything going on or, or maybe they didn't want to go too serious because they want to re- remind people of the, the way that the world is in right now. But, and they're not alone, Pepsi brand and, you know, a couple others, this article was about how they kind of, you know, were pulling out some of their normal ads that they'd be showing during the Super Bowl as well. So, you know, This is obviously different times that we're living in, but, you know, instead, because speaking of which, instead what they're going to use some of that money for is donate to um, vaccine awareness campaigns and try and get the word out there for COVID vaccines and to try to spread information about that. So, 
you know, not all of those millions of dollars are going towards that. They're probably just keeping some, but it's good that they're still kind of donating a little bit to that kind of cause. Yeah, man. I mean, yeah, I saw that Anheuser is, is, uh, they're not, when I first read it, I was like, Oh, they're completely abandoning the Super Bowl, And it's like, no, no, we're just not advertising Budweiser. We're still going to advertise our other stuff. Don't you worry. And I was like, Oh, okay. But then you read it and you're like, Oh, but they are going to take some of that money and put it towards Anheuser was the only one that said it. It, it. I didn't catch it. If it said it in there, but Pepsi wasn't, didn't say they were donating anything, but Anheuser Busch was going to donate to the coronavirus stuff. And I thought that was pretty, uh, pretty noble, I guess, to, to be cheesy, I guess. But I mean, when you look at it, cause I looked at, you know, it says a 30 second spot for this year's Super Bowl is $5.5 million. I always wonder, man. I mean, they must. Do these companies see that big of a boost in their product to justify that much money on a 30 second spot? It's just insane. Well, I would argue that it's the most watched television event of almost every year, probably. I, I'm not looking at the numbers, you know, I can't say for sure, but you know, it's it's gotta be up there as the one of the most watched television events in the country, like every year. Yeah. And and so, you know, I looked up, you know, it's it says and uh the iconic commercials of Budweiser are all, you know, the frogs chirping, the bud. Why is there that commercial? The WhatsApp and uh, the, the Clydesdales, which apparently made everybody cry in the middle of a Super Bowl game. And so, they, you know, for a commercial to be iconic, I guess it is a pretty big deal that there isn't a new one this year. There isn't going to be a new iconic, at, at least Budweiser commercial. And then, all, I mean, the WhatsApp commercials, like, I'd say it's like the most famous commercial ever made, probably. The movie, that thing was parodied in like every movie that came out at that time. Yeah. And, you know, another company that's kind of skipping or sort of skipping, you know, that was mentioned is Coke as well, Coca Cola Company. And, you know, that kind of leads me into my movie pick where, um, you know, product placement for Coca Cola has been on the rise in movies since about the 1980s. And, you know, this movie that I picked is no different where Coke kind of shows up in it, but also, and I'll tell you in a second, but so the movie I picked is the 1989 Batman directed by Tim Burton. And the reason I picked this one, like I said, Coke kind of shows up at some point in the movie as well, if you look close enough, but also there was a commercial that involved this movie's Alfred that was played on TV at the time when the movie came out. And also get this before VHS tapes that I used to watch like movies on VHS tapes where they had a couple commercial spots at the very beginning. This was on there as well. So if you're watching this on YouTube, I'm actually going to put a link to that old commercial down in the description here if you wanted to click on it and check it out. But, um, you know, it's a funny commercial, but, you know, getting back to the movie, I mean, this was the first kind of major Batman movie that I watched when I was a kid. And, you know, the only other one that kind of came before this in terms of a Batman feature length movie was the Adam West one, the, the full length movie with him. And I'm glad that this one came out in 1989 because it just it changed the, the Batman landscape for the better because. Don't get me wrong. I like going back and I wa I like watching the old Adam West car or not cartoons, but show sometimes. But, you know, the tone that was kind of established in this movie directed by Tim Burton with the, you know, gothic looking dark, you know, nighttime Gotham City and, you know, his Batman and Jack Nicholson as the Joker and, you know, some of the things he does in the movie. It's just a, a tone and a precedent that was set going forward with the other Batman movies afterwards, save for a few, you know, the goofier ones with George Clooney. But, you know, it was just, it came out at the right time and just, you know, took the, the world by storm. And I'm glad it kind of established this tone for Batman going forward, because look at the Batman, you know, the movie that we have coming out next year, maybe late this year, who knows, but you know, it's, it goes even darker and it's because of the 1989 Batman, because they allowed us to have that new kind of vision, like where we are now, that's where it kind of started with this movie. 
Yeah, yeah, the original Batman. I mean, yeah, Michael Keaton for my money is the best Batman. Uh, I I think, and I can't wait for. I, I don't know if it's actually been fully confirmed or whatever, but he's supposed to be back in the Flash movie, and I'll, I'll be there opening day. You know, sans COVID, hopefully when that comes out, just to see Michael Keaton back as Batman. But I'm looking at uh, Tim Burton's IMDb here, and it's he had only done two movies prior to getting Batman, and Batman is a big thing to get. And those two movies were Pee Wee's Big Adventure, and of course Beetlejuice, which is one of the best movies ever. And uh, so it's pretty interesting that the studio took that chance on on Tim Burton because Pee Wee and Beetlejuice are two kind of just offbeat movies. Right. You wouldn't think the guy who made those offbeat kind of crazy kooky movies would be the guy to bring the big superhero Batman to the screen. But I mean, if you know anything about Tim Burton, I know before before he did all that, he worked at Disney. He was a Disney animator. And that's where he like pitched, uh, you know, Nightmare Before Christmas. And he drew all that stuff and that's and all that. But, yeah, it's 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 interesting that Warner Brothers took the chance on him to do Batman and the rest is history. Cause I mean, I think that ushered in the world of realistic comic book style movies. Cause there were other comic book movies, I think before that, maybe not as big as a Batman. I mean, Howard the Duck, that was a comic book movie, but you know, they didn't, they weren't, they weren't grounded in some sort of reality, which Batman did. And, 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 you can see the influence through all of the Batman movies, especially Christopher Nolan's. So, yeah. What's your favorite Batman? If you had to pick, you know, all of I the, of I the certainly movies? I certainly see that a lot of people really love Keaton as Batman because they grew up with him and he's you know their Batman in their minds and and I agree with that. I love you know watching Batman to this day the 1989 movie, but. Um, you know, because I'm a big Batman fan, you know, just of the character. And I think page to screen, I think Ben Affleck bought the best vision of the character to life from translated from from page to screen. He's the most Batman that we've ever gotten. Now, I like other Batman movies more than the one that he's been in. Like, for instance, my favorite Batman movie and one of my favorite movies in general is The Dark Knight. But I think the translation of Batman from page to screen, Ben Affleck was truest to that vision. Huh. I was not expecting that. Um, ben Affleck is good. I, lo- I love Ben Affleck. Um, yeah, he was good. He, he obviously didn't appear in the best of the Batman movies. Um, we'll see how the Justice League Schneider Cut turns out. You know, everybody's clamoring for the Schneider Cut and then – those are the same people who crapped all over Batman versus Superman, which was the Snyder cut to begin with. So I'm curious to see how that turns out. I personally, I like Jared Leto's Joker. So I'm looking forward to more Jared Leto scenes because apparently he filmed some more stuff in it. But granted, his Joker doesn't touch Heath Ledger's, which for me is the all time greatest performance of any movie ever across any genre. His Joker is, I, I don't know if that's in focus, but I have like several uh, Heath Ledger Joker figures up there. And uh, obviously Joaquin Phoenix knocked it out of the park and his Joker. So, yeah, I, I, I'm looking forward to that. But Batman Returns, too, is one I watch every Christmas. Is that some, it's, it's, it's a Christmas movie. Technically, yeah. So, I think, have we said all we can say about Batman? Well, probably Shall not, we but let's on? you know, let's move on to your movies. So, <laughs> for for the sake of brevity, all right. So I just went. I took this in the way of commercials, and uh, you know, this is an article about commercials. And so my movie is a movie that opens on commercials. The commercials are part of the movie. I think you know what I'm talking about. Tropic Thunder. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Because. Tropic Thunder is, it's a top five funniest movie of all time to me. And I love it. And, and, and uh, Robert Downey Jr. in that movie is a top five performance of all time uh, for me. It's just, 
it's just one of the funniest movies ever made. And the way it opens with those fake commercials, I remember seeing it in theaters and people weren't sure what was going. They thought they thought there really was a, a you know, a, a Robert Downey Jr. and, to- and Tobey Maguire <laughs> love movie or whatever. And, and people were confused. And then the, the movie kicks in. And I, I just I love Tropic Thunder. How about you? Yeah, it's it's a uh, it's a really funny movie with, you know, a great cast and. You know, it, it's so funny, realistic to the point where, you know, watching those those previews for these fake movies before that, I almost kind of want to see those, you know, like like the the tug speedman, like, you know, the world, you know, boiling over or freezing over. And then you have like the, you know, uh, Academy Award nominated, you know, with the Tobey Maguire, like, you know, church romance. I'm like, those actually look like OK movies. You know, maybe I might think different if they were real and I watched them. But, you know, and the rest of the movie is just it's so great. And it's got some classic performances, especially like. <laughs> you know tom cruise probably steals the show for that one for me you know with just his performance as you know the the manager the agent whatever he is in the movie with ben stiller's character and it just you know and that's saying something because the rest of the movie like you know the performances that the other actors give i mean robert downey jr is hilarious in that ben stiller is hilarious jack black even jay barishaw like everybody in that movie is great It's, it's such like a good classic comedy i'm glad they didn't kind of sequel it to death you know after it was made yeah man it's uh i remember again seeing in theaters and i i knew i knew that was tom cruise going into it but i remember in the theater sitting next to people and they have you know they did the closing credits where they actually showed the person and put their name next to it and i was sitting next to a guy who went uh who was like that's tom cruise and it was just it was it was fun watching like that guy's reaction like oh holy crap that's Tom Cruise, and it was I just yeah there's nothing I can say better about that movie it is a top five comedy for me it's just it's damn near perfect. All right, so the next story we're gonna rock is gonna be this story that came out last week a little weird story about an Oregon guy who was uh, went to carjack somebody and when he did that he realized that there was a four-year-old left in the back of the car. So he actually went back, uh, took the car back, gave the child to the mother, berated the mother for leaving the child in the car, and then continued to steal her car again. And it was just a feel-good story of the week for me. You know, he, he, he took the kid back. I mean, I guess... There's only there's only a, a certain level of crime you're willing to go to as a as a as a as a person. So what do you think about that story? I mean, I'll be honest, uh, to the point where he went back and, and chastised the mother. I was on the car thief side because <laughs> it, it almost as you're reading this about the series of events in real time. If you were there, it almost kind of sounds like he bought the car back, gave the mama a verbal lashing and then for a second kind of sounded like maybe he was going to leave the car because he wanted to return the kid, but then he stole the car. So it's like, you can't feel all the way bad for him, but you know, I do kind of empathize with him because look, it said the mom was right inside the store within sight line of the car, but the car was unlocked and running with her kids still there. Like I, I know it must've been an extra hassle to like turn the car off, take the kid inside with you, do your quick five minute business and come right back out, strap the the kid back into the car, turn it back on and then leave. But look, that would be my thinking is if I did that, where if my car is unlocked and my kid is in there and it's still running, I got to assume the worst that somebody is able to run up, you know, that's hiding around the corner, steal the car and then get away. You know, I don't know. It's an interesting story. But besides all that, my movie, step into my movie. The only thing I went with was a movie about stealing cars because that's, I tried to look up movies where there were people in the car. There's a movie from the 94, I think with Tom Arnold called carpool. I almost went with that one, but I had a feeling you had never heard of that one. And from that face, I can tell you had. So I went with gone in 60 seconds. Cause that movie is all about car thieves and it's a freaking awesome movie. And it's another one of those movies that got a lot of crap because it's just a good action movie, I think. Um, first and foremost, have you seen it? 
I think I saw parts of it on TV once, you know, like um, it's what this was one of those ones I saw it on TV and kind of like tuned in and out, you know, while it was on. So I, I think I like have seen parts of it, but not all the way through. Okay. It's a good one, man. It's, a, it's just a solid little action movie. Nick Cage plays a, uh, a career car thief who's out of the game, but then his brother takes it, takes up the, uh, takes up the family business. He gets in some trouble and, and, uh, Nicholas Cage has to reassemble his crew who has all gone on to better lives and reassemble them to take on one night of stealing a bunch of cars uh, to pay off his brother's debt. And it's good, man. It's got uh, Delroy Lindo in it, who is a, a front runner this year for the Oscars for the five bloods. So I, I look forward to hopefully him pulling an Oscar nomination. Cause I'm just a fan of that guy. Um, so it's just one of those, it's one of those early two thousands action movies, you know, it's that there, you can say that phrase and you know, the type of movie you're talking about. So, you know, this story for me kind of, um, you know, before he returned the car and the kid, this was basically kidnapping. So, you know, there's a, a ton of kidnap esque movies out there, but I decided to pick one of my favorite movies ever to kind of go along with this. And it's not a big kidnap movie, but still takes place in the movie. And the movie is the silence of the lambs. And this is, this is another all timer for me. Um, I guess technically it qualifies as a horror movie. I would say it's more kind of a, a thriller, but I could see the people that argue it's a horror movie. So I can't really say it's my favorite horror movie ever because I'm not sure that it qualifies as a strictly horror movie, but this is one of my favorite movies ever. And I saw it for the first time, actually not too, too long ago. Um, I think it was like a few years back. I want to say like three, four years ago, I watched this for the first time. I had known about it. I knew the gist of the movie, who was in it, so on and so forth. But when I actually sat down and watched it, I just, I absolutely loved it. And I think it absolutely still holds up today. I can't stand the series that they're going to do on CBS, Clarice, that's coming out because they don't have the rights to use Hannibal Lecter, his name, or anything associated with it. So it's literally just robbing that IP and dressing it up as just another detective show. So I, I can't stand that. and I'm not going to watch that. But um, I do love the movie. I think Anthony Hopkins as Hannibal Lecter just, I mean, you know, it was a very worthy Oscar performance. And, you know, this was one of the last movies in the horror genre, horror, to, you know, be nominated for as many Academy Awards as it was, and deservedly so. It's just a creepy, very well-made movie that, you know, I still love watching all the time. Yeah, and it's, uh, it is one of the best, and that's another one. We've covered a lot of my top five performances of all time and Hannibal Lecter is number two just behind Heath Ledger that's uh my second favorite performance of any actor of anything of all time and uh for one I didn't know that they couldn't use the IP for Hannibal I guess because of the other show Hannibal that's is that what it is but I I agree with that the Clarice show if that was like an HBO show I'd probably be like well, that, I'll watch that because HBO can take it to a limit that I would watch. But when it's a CBS show, it's just going to be a procedural. I have no interest in watching it. Yeah, it's it's just going to be another watered down, just plain old police detective show because they're not allowed to use Hannibal Lecter or anything associated with him, which makes almost the entire thing pointless. But then basically why even more people kind of hate the idea of this show coming out is because the show Hannibal that used to run on NBC, um, you know, got canceled sort of, but it's still kind of out there because most of the people behind the show seem still interested in doing it if possible at some point. So, you know, it finished kind of airing a few years ago, so it's not totally out of the picture yet, but, you know, CBS, because NBC dropped the show. So CBS could have picked up Hannibal the show and kind of went with it from there and had some of the same actors and creative team come back. But instead they went with the show Clarice, which is kind of, you know, hindering Hannibal, which people 
you know, the fan base for that show absolutely loves it. And I really liked it, you know, maybe not quite as obsessed with it as the hardcore fans, but I did watch the three existing seasons of Hannibal and I was very impressed. Um, and also because it was a cable show as well, but it really pushed a lot more limits and told a lot better story than I'm sure this Clarice show will. So I want to live in a world where we had a continuation of the same cast and the same creative team from Silence of the Lambs that did the sequels to that because Anthony Hopkins as Hannibal Lecter was the only continuation of that and they didn't really have the same writers or director for the other ones and the same crew or same cast excuse me because Jodie Foster didn't come back and instead they had Julianne Moore replace her in the sequel and you know I'm sure she does a good job I haven't seen it but it just you know without the same team behind it and the same people it just, it feels different. It's not quite as good. So, you know, I want to live in that fantasy world where that did happen, where you had a continuation of the greatness that came from Silence of the Lambs and came to these other movies. Same thing with another example that comes to my mind when I say something like that is Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, because David Fincher, a director who I, who I really liked, didn't really come on board for the sequels. And you know, Daniel Craig and Rooney Mara, who did such a great job in Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, Girl with the Dragon Tattoo in 2011, they did such a great job. And then they made these sequels with totally different creative teams and cast as the same people, same continuation of the story before. So, you know, a little off track, but, you know, I do want to live in a world where those things happen, where right. proper sequels were made instead of just throwing away the people that made the, the great original ones. Well, I'll go off on that girl. So the sequel, the girl who kicked the hornet's nest or whatever, not that great. But go back and watch the Swedish Girl with the Dragon Tattoo trilogy. Phenomenal. With Numi Rapace. Numi Rapace plays uh, Lizbeth. Check those out. They're so, they're phenomenal. If you liked David Fincher's, which I agree is phenomenal and is one of his best, check out, if you ever get a chance, check out the Swedish originals. But um, to go back to, to Hannibal and all those. The sequel, Hannibal, was good. I, I'm not going to fault a movie that was directed by Ridley Scott, even though it wasn't the original team of uh, of, uh, of Jonathan Demme. I, I can't go against Ridley Scott, but I will say it was not as good as Sil Silence is iconic. Hannibal, Hannibal was good, and then Red Dragon was was pretty good, which was essentially just a remake of, of Manhunter, which was the original. Uh, uh, Thomas Harris adaptation of uh, with Hannibal where it was a Brian Cox from Succession plays Hannibal so yeah good good movies no interest in the show the end so when I said at the top of the episode that this would be an emotional one is because another one of our stories from this past week was that um, Vanessa Bryant the wife of Kobe Bryant kind of paid a tribute to him on social media because it was the one year anniversary of him and his daughter, along with the other passengers of that plane's passing. And, you know, uh, the daughter, Gigi, um, one of her best friends kind of wrote a beautiful letter on Instagram to her and Vanessa Bryant commented on it and kind of said, thank you for these kind words and, you know, kind of honored Kobe in her own way. But, you know, this one still hits hard. Um, I remember when I found out about the news that it was really shocking because, um, you know, it was really sad because uh, Kobe was somebody who I still thought had so much to give, you know, his life after basketball. He wasn't nearly done with it. Um, this wasn't in the article, but I did a little bit of digging on, on him to get some more background information for the show. And you know, I knew that uh, a couple of years prior, he had actually won the Academy Award for best uh, short film, short feature, whatever it's called, for his short film, Dear Basketball. And I had not seen it up until this point. I actually watched it for the first time the other night. And it's um, it just hits really hard. It, it's it's really touching. Not only is it a, a really touching tribute to Kobe's career before he had passed, because it's this really beautifully animated, beautifully narrated and told story about Kobe as a six-year-old and his dream of making it to the NBA. 
and him finally knowing when to call it quits, his body telling him. And, you know, it's emotional and it hits home just on its own, even before his death. And when you factor in that, it just, man, it, it just really hits you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I actually do remember where I was when I heard Kobe Bryant die. I mean, I, I'll be honest, I'm not a huge basketball fan, so I was, I'm not like a diehard Kobe Bryant fan, but it was, it was shocking as hell when you heard he died. And, uh, it was me and my friends were out. This was right before COVID hit. So we were in a restaurant. Remember those days where you could go to restaurants and it was actually the day of the Pro Bowl. And we were watching the Pro Bowl up on the big screen of sports bar. Uh, and we were watching the Pro Bowl and then they cut into the Pro Bowl to say that there had been a helicopter accident and Kobe Bryant was potentially on it or something like that. They still weren't sure. And then as the time went on, it was Kobe Bryant was on the, uh, was on the thing. And we, I, that, that dictated the rest of the conversation at the table for the rest of the day, because what originally happened was my friend's dad texted him and said, Kobe Bryant died. And then, so we're watching up there and they hadn't confirmed it yet. And then like a couple seconds later, it was confirmed. And so it was, it was, you know, we talked about these deaths earlier, Hank Aaron, Larry King, Cloris Leachman, Cecily Tyson, you know, Cloris Leachman, Cecily Tyson were in their 90s. Larry King was in his 80s. I think Hank Aaron was in his 80s. You're expecting to hear they're going to pass away. You know, those aren't those, those, when you hear it, you're like, oh man, that's, that's sad. I like them. But when it was like a Kobe Bryant um, or a Chadwick Bozeman or something, when those deaths come along, you're just like, oh wow, that's, that's shocking. And his death was shocking. And I remember the, uh, watching, you know, the t- TV after that. And I, I even, I DVR'd, um, inside the NBA, you know, the show, Chuck, uh, Shaquille O'Neal and Charles Barkley and Rick Fox was on it. I don't know if you remember, but Rick Fox was originally, he, they said he was on the helicopter when it went down. And so that Wednesday, they had Rick Fox on and he was talking about how like, yeah, what his family was going through when they thought he was on the helicopter with him. So it was just, it was a story. It was a, it was a celebrity death that, um, that lasted for a while. A lot of times celebrity deaths will maybe come and, and forgotten about, but his, and, and lasted for the conversation dictated that entire week of, of TV. And even a year later, obviously we're still big stories being told about this. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, when people go early, they tend to go down in history. They tend to be bigger than maybe they would be if they had lived a full life and, and quietly passed away. So because of that, Kobe will go down in history, I think, as, as one of those people, like a, like a Kurt Cobain or something like that. And, uh, so. So the movie I picked for this one, um, you know, I'm not sure who would have known or who did know, but Kobe was actually a big uh, Harry Potter fan. So I just went with the the first film in the live action Harry Potter series, which was Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. And, you know, the Harry Potter movies are interesting to me because um, I think there was a point where for me watching them, they just kind of took a turn and got a little bit uh, more realistic and kind of darker color palette and just maybe less magical overall because it started off, you know, those first few and everyone usually pretty much agrees that they hit the high note with the films with the third one, which is Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. But going back to the first one, it was just such a sensation when it came out and just people absolutely loved it because it did still feel magical and bright and you know had this you know energy to it and then by the time you get to like the second part of the last movie you know for me it just feels so gray and just you know almost like too realistic that it's like hey where were the bright you know kind of colorful magical aspects and the the childlike feeling that we had in the first ones and you know i guess you could say they wanted to grow the movies with the cast and that that's fair. But, you know, to me, it just, you know, their magicalness kind of dissipated as they went on. So when it comes to Harry Potter movies, I've only ever seen each of them one time. They're OK. 
I'm not a diehard Harry Potter fan. Uh, I did actually like them as they got darker. Um, I did prefer the later ones to the earlier ones because I, I, I like darker storytelling. Um, yeah, there's not really much I can add to a Harry Potter conversation. Like I said, saw them once, thought they were okay. It's, you know, people have their diehard franchises, Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter. Those are all movies. I've seen them. I've enjoyed them. Not, I don't watch them all the time. And so that's, I, I, and that's fair, yeah. you know, because people are, are dedicated to the things that they love. And, you know, they're avid fans of all those. And, you know, like almost every other movie out there based on a book, I will say the books are better. If you haven't, for some reason, if you haven't read any of the books or seen any of the movies somehow, I would highly recommend you either read the books first and then watch the movies or just read the books. Just to move on. And so the movie I picked for this one is the one you already touched on, which was Dear Basketball. Um, you know, like you said, he, he won the Oscar for it. It's a really good animated short. Um, not only it, – it, it, it sh- I'm a fan of writing. I love good writing. And um, that was good writing. That was something he had written – after he had retired and then the animator whose name I don't have in front of me, but the animator kind of came to him and just like, let's marry these things together. And they did. And, and it's, as I said, I'm not a big basketball fan, but I can appreciate great writing, but that was great writing. And, and, and uh, I can say, you know, I, I try and watch, um, I'm a big uh, Oscar and I'm a big awards guy. I love the award season. So when it comes to the award season, I tend to watch everything nominated, the documentaries, the shorts. I watch, I try and watch all the content nominated for the Oscars before the Oscars come up so that I have, so I can, I'm invested. And so, you know, I see, I saw all of them and that was, that was the best one of the year. It was, it was the deserved Oscar winner. And it lets you know that, you know, that dude could have, could have potentially penned you know, a great basketball movie or just a great movie. Like I had the, the writing in that was poetry. It was like, it was just good. I don't even know how to say it, it was just good writing. And, and the animation that went with it, phenomenal. Great, great, not traditional animation. It was like, it was like kind of, it was, I don't even know how to explain it. It was like this weird off brand, almost like a Spider-Man into the dark kind of, um, kind of looking where it's like different animation that you've never seen before. So I, I really appreciated that. Yeah. Obviously normally we would kind of pick a, a full length movie to go along with an article like this, but I think that's, that's a great pick because it just, you know, if you haven't seen it yet, you can find it online, YouTube, just kind of type in deer basketball and, you know, kind of check it out. I highly recommend if you haven't seen it yet to check it out. And it just, like I said, it just, it hits, so hard not only if you're a kobe bryant fan even before his death but especially afterwards and it just seems to to fit you know his departing and it just man it it just it makes you really emotional so the next story since this is a movie podcast and like i just said i am a diehard award season fan the uh award season finally kicked off this week after a delay due to COVID, everything, all the awards are being delayed this year. And um, so the independent spirit awards were finally announced and uh, I am a actual member. I am film independent. There's, oh, can't show you my member ID. But I am a member of the film independent community and uh, which is sweet. It means I get to vote in these things. And uh, so First off, you ever watch the Independent Spirit Awards when they're on or no? Um, no, because I, with how many different award shows there are out there, the only ones I usually watch are the Oscars because obviously they're on the biggest stage and they cover a lot of different territory, even if they don't always get the, the winners right or the picks right. But those are usually the the ones that I watch. Right on. Yeah, I, I, when it comes to award season, it's, uh, I try to watch them all, but SAG Awards, Independent Spirit Awards are two I get to actually vote in. So I watch those I love, Golden Globes and Oscars. And I always say Oscars, unless the 49ers or Chiefs are playing in the Super Bowl, which the Chiefs are playing in the Super Bowl this year, 
I look forward to the Oscars more than I look forward to like any other event on TV for the year. So, so with this one, you know, I just figured talk about some of the nominees and, and one of the big nominees for this year is a movie called sound of metal, which is on Amazon prime right now. And I don't know if you've got to see it, but it's about a, a drummer who loses his hearing and it is, it is phenomenal. It, it's without a doubt, one of the best movies of the year. And uh, it's Riz Ahmed who plays the lead. And uh, there's a guy named Paul, Paul Martin, Marky Marcy, who is in it, who um, I really hope he gets nominated for the Oscar because he is, he's so good. He's not, he is an actual guy whose, whose parents were deaf and he's not deaf, but he is a big in the film community. He's big in, in terms of um, sign language and, and helping the deaf community and his performance in this is, is it's one of the best I've seen in, in a very long time. So First off, I doubt you've seen it yet. Have you seen that? Um, no, I know of that movie. The thing I usually do with awards movies is if I haven't seen it yet, I kind of use these award nominations as a jumping off point to kind of pay attention to some of these films because if I miss them during the year that they came out from the past year or I see a movie that's winning a, a bunch of awards that I haven't seen yet or didn't really know about, I'll kind of use these award shows as a jumping off point to kind of get into some of them if I didn't really actively follow some of these lower key, you know, uh, award season movies before they were nominated. Right on. Paul Racy is his name, R-A-C-I. I, it, it slipped my brain. But I mean, this year we got a lot of people are wondering how the award season was going to shape up this year because – Obviously, movies were not normal in 2020, but we got a lot of good movies coming around. You got Nomad Land with Francis McDormand, which is supposed to be a phenomenal movie, and it's directed by a uh, Asian American uh, Asian. I don't know if she's Asian American, but an Asian woman who's also directing The Eternals, which is the new Mar big Marvel movie that's coming out. So I'm 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 looking forward to that one, and I, I think I think uh, I think that's going to be good. Hopefully. It should be coming out here soon. And you got uh, Chadwick Boseman, as we just mentioned. He will potentially be winning an Oscar, a posthumous Oscar this year for Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, which I have not seen yet, but it's on my list uh, to watch before the Oscars come around, before SAG and everything. Um, it's just There was a lot of good movies. A Promising Young Woman, Carrie Mulligan, another phenomenal movie that came out just recently. And, and it's... it's uh, I, I'm. I didn't think that we were going to have a, a plethora of of movies that were going to be like the awards worthy movies this year. I, I am pleasantly surprised at the list we got. They all. I've seen only a few of them so far, but most of you know they're all on my list to watch over the next couple of weeks. And it looks like we're going to finish the year, even though we're in 2021. But they extended the the window it looks like we're going to finish the year strong with some really good movies so i'll be honest when you sent this article over to me i knew of a lot of these movies but i haven't really seen that many because again i kind of use award season as a jumping off point to know which ones i might want to see but there was i think there was one movie on this list that i had seen that i knew about and had seen already and i really liked it and it's going to be my pick and that is The Invisible Man. And this one is nominated in this article for the Spirit Awards for Best Editing. And I don't know if it's going to win that because, again, I haven't seen the other ones in the same category. But I certainly hope it does because it's, The Invisible Man is a very award-deserving movie. It was very good. And this was another one of those that came out in theaters in 2020, kind of shortly before everything shut down. So... If I remember correctly, I think this was the last movie that I saw before, you know, the whole system kind of shut down last year in 2020. And, you know, I really liked it because I'm a big I'm really hopeful that we can get good movies made out of these universal movie monster characters. So when I say that, I mean, Dracula, Frankenstein, the mummy obviously the invisible man creature from the black lagoon 
these are characters who movies were made about them a long time ago, decades ago. And, you know, I'm always optimistic that we can get another good modern iteration of some of these characters. And some of them have been a little bit lacking over the years. People have tried to make good movies about them. Um, you know, the infamous 2017, the mummy with Tom Cruise and just that one was, didn't hit the right notes, but, uh, the invisible man is just, I think it's so smart and it's such a modern take on it with the trauma that Elizabeth Moss's character experiences and, you know, the way that it's done and the explanation that's given for how the villain is able to become invisible. And, you know, we're not going to get too deep into spoilers here because again, it just came out last year and maybe people haven't seen it yet, but it is on HBO max right now, if you wanted to check it out, but um, you know, it was just so smart and so such a modern take yet. It wasn't kind of pandering to modern audiences specifically. So let me get your take on it. What do you think about the invisible man? Oh, without a doubt, I love. I loved it. Uh, the writer and director is Lei Wan L, who I've been a fan of since his first movie, which you may know. Saw. He was the other guy in the room. Carrie Elway's and him. He's the other guy in the room, and he wrote it. He wrote the original Saw, and him and uh, James Wan have been. They were writing partners and directing partners, and everything. And then James Wan kind of started the Insidious franchise, and then Lei Wan L took it over towards the end. And then he went out and did this one because before this, he did the Insidious 3, but he did Upgrade, which was phenomenal. And then he did the Invisible Man. So this guy as a director is just, he's hes great, man. He's a phenomenal director. And I don't know if you the original saw that ending for me, one of the best endings of all time. But I was looking it up as you were talking. And I'm paying attention, but I was looking it up because i you were talking about wanting more of the uh, monster movies. And... I remember that he was hired. They're going to do another monster movie with him as the writer and director. And I, I wanted to look up which one it is. And it's Wolfman. He's doing Wolfman next. So yeah, he's, he, it's going to be good. And, and in terms of the nominations, I'll, I'll go a step further and say that Elizabeth Moss kind of got screwed out of a nomination for female lead. She was good, man. She was really good. And it would have been nice to have seen her, and it kind of goes back to the conversation we had, I think it was last week's episode, talking about horror actresses, where you mentioned um, Tony Collette from Hereditary, where they're just, that genre doesn't get the, the respect it does when The Invisible Man is a movie that should be getting respect in acting and directing, and and it it's getting editing, which it deserves, editing, hopefully that, that carries through to the Oscars. But um, yeah, I... If, in terms of horror movies, I'd say that was, for my money, one of the best horror movies to come out in the last five years. Yeah, I would have to agree with you on that one because I think this one definitely classifies as horror, even though it doesn't look and sound like some of the other horror movies out there that deal with supernatural threats or things like that. But, you know, the villain in it is just so scary and you don't you just don't know what he's planning or what he's going to do and he always seems to have a step on you know the protagonist and he just like you know comes across as a really scary you know intimidating villain and again you know the way that they did it with a modern twist on the old story and it just it's just so great and you're right it's it, it's a shame that people in horror movies especially actresses don't get more credit for the work that they put in because you know, in the situations that their characters face in horror movies, you know, they're always kind of pushed to the limit and they have to really, you know, put on a display in terms of acting for characters that are at their wits end and are being terrified and scared. And, you know, it's like I would argue that that almost takes more acting ability than giving a really subtle, quiet, nuanced performance from another actor in a different movie. So it's really a shame that this movie didn't get more respect uh, for award season. So this is the part of the episode where we usually wrap up with a new release movie of the week. And we're going to put that word release in kind of parentheses because obviously there aren't a lot of big new theatrical releases coming in recent times. And there probably won't be for a little bit. So instead what we're going to do is, you know, we did Soul and Wonder Woman for the last two episodes and instead, we're going to switch it up and we're going to talk about whoever's kind of hosting each week's episode 
we're going to talk about a new movie that one of us just saw for the first time during the past week and kind of talk about that. So, so I'm going to go this week. And the movie I want to talk about is Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And, you know, this is still a new one. So I guess it wouldn't be spoilers because it's kind of based on real events, but um, we'll still try not to talk about the ending too much. But, you know, I didn't really know going in that this was based off of of real events. I guess I just didn't know my history that well because I had thought when I first saw the trailer that this was just a going to be a period movie taking place during the 60s, 70s, directed by Quentin Tarantino about old Hollywood. And I thought like, okay, I'm in for that anyway. But then I kind of found out the history behind it and it kind of added this this other twist to it to an already like an already great movie because I really did like it and I thought it was very well made. So, you know, it almost kind of adds like another dimension to this movie that's that's already great for what it is. Yeah, man. I remember when that first got announced, um, everybody was like, oh, my God, she's doing a Charles Manson movie. And it was like. And and so you were, and then he kept saying, it's not a Charles Manson movie. It just takes place in that world. And so it, it comes across now you see the movie and you it's it's kind of like Inglorious Bastards in that it re- does not follow history to a T. It is a revisionist history. It's what he wanted to do because the movie is it's about Leonardo DiCaprio. It is about an actor who has fallen from stardom and he is trying to get back into it and and he's 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 just down on himself he's got his stunt double who's sticking by his side you know brought brad pitt his first acting oscar his second oscar overall the first acting oscar and uh i liked it because yeah it was the story the manson story is really that he lives next door to sharon tate and roman polanski and that is more important to the story of the lead character dicaprio's character than manson manson is Manson really is completely secondary to what this movie is about, which is a character study of an actor losing his his mojo, if I could quote Austin Powers. Um, I, I loved it. I, I love Tarantino. He's obviously one of my favorite writer-directors. Um, so Tarantino, for me, can, can do no wrong. The ending of that movie is that shit insane and i love every second of it so uh yeah man what can you say yeah i um you know because i knew talking about this movie this week that on paper i would have expected you to like it because i know you're a big quentin tarantino fan i know you're a brad pitt fan and you know i know you like some kind of some of those darker elements that are in movies so on paper i i knew that you were gonna gonna like this movie going in I mean, I'm, DiCaprio is, is one of my, uh, I'd say he's my second favorite actor of all time. And, and Brad Pitt is third. It goes Tom Hanks, Leonardo DiCaprio, Brad Pitt. And that's because, and honestly, when I started writing for this, uh, this Joe Blow movie network, check them out. Ah. Um, when I started writing for them, the writing sample I gave them was a paper I had written just for myself. Just I wanted to write a paper on Leonardo DiCaprio. And so I written like a five page paper on DiCaprio going over his entire career. Cause I consider DiCaprio to be the smartest actor working today. He picks his roles. Think about the directors he continues to work with. He worked with Tarantino twice. He's worked with Scorsese, I think like eight times or something like that. I mean, the guy continuously, he, he makes, the right choices for his career. His next movie is an Adam McKay movie um, with Jennifer Lawrence. I mean, the guy is just one of the smartest actors ever. And he can pull, he does every role. I mean, think about his Tarantino roles in, in um, Django Unchained. He is a racist piece of absolute garbage in that movie. You hate him. And the way he says white cake, you hate it. <laughs> but, and then, you know, you have Once Upon a Time in, in, in Hollywood where he's just, a beaten down movie star who's 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 not getting the roles he wants i mean that guy is he like i said one two three those are my, those are my mount rushmore of actors 
Yeah. So if you're looking for a movie from the last couple of years, because again, we didn't have that many movies in 2020 and you're maybe going a little bit farther back to see some of these new release movies that you maybe haven't seen yet. I would say if you like some of the stuff that we kind of talked about discussing once upon a time in Hollywood, you know, either the actors or the setting or movies based on um, some historical events kind of with this one. But if you like any of those things, I definitely do recommend checking this one out. I think it's definitely a, a good effort from Tarantino. I, uh, I agree. It's, it's top. He's done what? Eight, nine movies for Tarantino. It's not the best Tarantino movie because I don't think anything can really be Pulp Fiction or, or Reservoir Dogs really. Um, it's not his worst either, but honestly, the worst Tarantino is better than 99% of other movies. So check it out. So thank you so much for watching. If you're watching this on YouTube, if you're listening to it, thank you for tuning in as well. We'll be back again next week, same time, Monday, 10 a.m. Eastern, with a new episode of this weekly podcast, Life Imitating Movies. So thank you all for tuning in. Don't forget to do all the YouTube things if you're watching, the, the likes, the subscribes, all the different stuff, the comments. It, it boosts our metrics, so we really appreciate it. So, you know, if you have anything for us to kind of talk about or stories or movies that maybe you might want to see, you know, feel free to comment, you know, no guarantee that they might make the cut, but... We really appreciate everybody who kind of tunes into this this show with us, Mitch and Brad here. So thank you all. And we'll be back again with a new episode next week.